Welcome to Experience Michigan on the show's producer Kelsey Zebrin and we have a special episode for you today as we are going to be featuring part of a documentary about a one-of-a-kind car that went on a journey of restoration and then we were going to have an interview with Rick and Don Lyons who is the person responsible for that journey with that car. Now on Thursday and Friday when this show aired uh, we were able to show that in its entirety which was about an hour and unfortunately we only have half that time today so if you want to see the whole thing check us out on our website and you can watch the doc and the entire interview with Rick and Don. Well, there it is. Just need to get it loaded up and out to the shop. Well, I've known about this car for over 40 years. It was in a large and quite well-known collection in Detroit. I had an interest in Stoddard Dayton's at that time. We bought our first Stoddard Dayton about 1975, and this was shortly after that. Uh, he had no interest in selling it, but we were so taken with it that we did a pencil and paper rubbing of the data plate and put that in our Stoddard Dayton file. Okay, Bill, you wanna drive? I'd offer to start it for you, but I don't think the crank's with it. In their ads, they were billed as the most beautiful car in the city. This car stands out from the rest, though. It's a 1910 Stoddard Dayton limousine. Don Lyons has a love for Stoddard Daytons. He also has a passion for restoring cars, something instilled in him by his father. This is to be Don's last restoration, the only Stoddard Dayton limo in existence. I never forgot the car. I always had one of those little itches that you get in the back of your mind that wasn't going to be satisfied until I knew what became of that car. Mm -hmm. Looks like somebody tried to refinish it, but it's the correct Pittsfield box. About four years ago, I got a telephone call from a guy in Vancouver, British Columbia. He opened the conversation by saying, I just brought a large collection, 55 cars. I'm going to keep about a dozen of them for myself and sell the rest. In that dozen that I'm going to keep is a Stoddard Dayton limousine. It's missing some parts. Whenever I go on the internet looking for Stoddard Dayton stuff, I see your name. Might you have some Stoddard Dayton parts. And I said, yes, I do. Uh, quite frankly, I've been collecting everything Stoddard Dayton I could get my hands on for over 40 years. I said, what are you missing? So he rattled off a list of parts that he was missing. And I said, well, so far, everything you're telling me I have. Well, let's see what we got under here. Whoops. There's some few pieces missing. empty holes I wish I didn't see. But we've got another one, same model, same make. So we should be able to replace everything easily enough. Well, that other one, as you recall, had the uh, engine detonated and it came out the crankcase on both sides, cut the oil pan in half, cut both cams in half, wound up the connecting rods, sheared the rockers off. So if this is missing a few parts, it looks pretty straightforward. Got the Lunkenheimer with it. This is supposed to have like three. Yeah, it's got the bigger D4 mag on it. So, and I've got one. That won't be a problem. And in the end, I had everything that he needed, uh, including the data plate, which had gotten separated from the car and was lost. But I still had that pencil and paper rubbing in our files. Of course, he wanted to know what I wanted for this. And I said, well, I'm not going to do another one of these cars. And, any kind of foreseeable future. The stuff is just sitting on my shelf in the workshop. When I'm gone, it'll probably get sold at a yard sale for 50 cents. So I'll tell you what, I'll just give it to you. With the understanding that if you ever decide to sell this car, I get first right to refuse it. About five months later, I got a call from him saying, you know what, I'm never gonna get to this car. You need it worse than I do. I'd like to see you have it. Why don't we get it together and get a deal done? For Don, this restoration is not about flipping a car or making money. It's the culmination of years of relationships and years of dedication to the craft of restoring automobiles. This process could easily take a couple of years, but Don's hope in the end is to bring this piece of automotive history that is nearly 110 years old back to its original glory. 
every part of it is just like what you'd like to have to start the restoration of a car 109 years old. Okay, let her down, Jeff. Don has worked with Sunray Restoration for years. Bill Gottesack actually worked on Don's father's cars. They start with the engine. This beast could produce around 50 HP, and it's actually in pretty good shape, even though it's over a century old. Everything has to go round and round and up and down, or it doesn't work. And this motor was immaculately well cared for when we took it apart. And oftentimes when we take an old motor apart, we will re-engineer components. We will re-engineer the oil pump to put in, hiding it within the capacity of the old pump, but put in a new gear-driven pump rather than the old plunger pump. We'll run a pressurized oil system where uh, they might have used uh, slingers and just a couple, three pounds of pressure. Um, we'll re-engineer to use a modern 40 pounds of pressure. Some of the parts will have to be remade. This is the heavy piston and rod assembly. The first thing you notice is how thick this is right here. A modern car, this might be 5 30 seconds. This right here looks what, 5 16 maybe even bigger, maybe 3 8 And somebody has been in here before because they, this is an oil ring and they put that in there. But, and the other thing is this piston is a cast iron piston which is extremely heavy and we'll replace it with uh, aluminum pistons, small skinny rings, less drag, less friction, and they do a better job than what these big old things used to do. Oil control rings hadn't been invented yet, so if you see pictures of these old cars always smoking, that's because of the oil they're burning. So we typically do those kind of things. This motor was so nice that the only thing we did was replace the cast iron pistons with aluminum pistons. With hemispherical combustion chambers, it could be considered the world's first Hemi. 355 cubic inches with dual spark plugs, inclined overhead valves, dual ignition, and dual cams. It was one of the most technically advanced engines of its time. A modern belt is going to be made out of rubber and it's gonna have grooves in it so it runs on a pulley. A mid-century belt is going to be a V-belt, but before that, when they first started this engine here in 1910, they just took a piece of leather, flat leather, cut it to approximately the right width, and then I've seen them sewed together. I've seen them, they have a special belt, clips that hold it together, and this one right here, somebody just took some wire and they wired the belt together. Looking at the age cracks on here, this belt's been on here for many, many, many years. I don't think it's the original belt, but it's it's probably at least 70 or 80 years on it. Bill feels pretty good about the transmission. Transmission condition, I'd say we're just about perfect. I don't see any chip gears. I don't see any broken gears. I don't see any jammed gears where somebody tried to shift it and into gear before the correct time. I see no reason why this transmission would not work really well just the way it is right now. But we'll take it apart anyway because I can't see everything. We'll clean it all up. What I really can't see is the bearings. We'll make sure that they're all in good condition. Um, if, if there is a broken gear in there, there's a place in Cadillac, Michigan that builds gears and we'll uh, get new gears built. We left in the old oil pump. We left in the old oiling system. Everything was still so nice and obviously worked so well and so effectively. But, uh, there was no need to replace any of that. We didn't. Uh, another thing that we frequently do is uh, take out the old Babbitt bearings and put in modern shell bearings. We didn't do that. The bearings were still wonderful. Stoddards were known for their performance. In 1909, a two-seater version of the Stoddard Dayton won the inaugural race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway.
What does this tag mean, Don? That is the serial number of the car. Really? Yep. 10F277. So that was the 277th F built. In starting this or any other restoration, one of the first things you have to do is decide what parts you have, what parts you don't have. And what we're going to do is start with these little devices that hold the windows in place because the windows are able to lower down. One of the things they are required to do is pull back out of the way in order that the window which would be activated by this strap, which would normally be attached there, would allow you to pick the window out of the channel, lower it down into the pocket, secure it there, and then put these back so that the window again doesn't rattle. Now, in looking at this, each window has at least two of these that lower, so we have two here, two back there, four here because these are sliding windows rather than lowering windows. And we should have two on the other side. However, we only have one. So we're going to have to recreate one of these because it would be impossible to expect to go out and find one of those. Fortunately, we have a machine shop that is very capable and able to do something like that with relatively little difficulty. Another part that we're missing is the little latch that retains the windows because these front windows both fold down and up to give a full flow of air through. So we're going to have to recreate one of those, which again means taking it off and taking it to the machine shop to have that done. Some other parts that are missing are these little clips, and there's a cord that extends from the window shade, because there's literally a pull down window shade, a cord that extends from the window shade down to here, and that needs to have um, three of those missing parts recreated. So again, that's another one that will have to be done. And there are also little tabs at the end of that cord that are also going to have to be recreated. There's uh, about 15 of those that we'll have to make. The goal in all of this is to conserve as much of the original interior as possible. That's extremely important to me. This car is one of a kind. It's the only Stoddard Dayton limousine known to exist. And to be able to capture as much of the original car as possible is critical. So we're going to go to some extra trouble with this restoration that you might not in a, uh, let's say a less important restoration. Are you sure you want to restore this thing? And of course, uh... His answer always is, sure, inch by inch, it's a cinch. <laughs> and okay, let's go for it. It's, it's a labor of love, it really is. If you don't enjoy doing this, it's just gonna seem like a job. Uh, so you've gotta enjoy the fact that you're recreating something of historical value that uh, other people are gonna enjoy to see. You know, and maybe you'll even get to drive occasionally, who knows. I'd also like to know whether they painted over the original maroon paint or uh, whether they stripped it and just started over again. Because this is an aluminum, a very thin aluminum sheet, only about 30 seconds of an inch thick, over a wooden frame. So we have to be very careful not to in any way dent or hurt the aluminum skin. Um, if the original paint is still under there, it'll help us know exactly what color it was. And also then I'm hopeful that we can find some of the original pinstriping to know what color that was and how it was applied. Because even though I clearly remember the maroon paint from 40 years ago, I don't remember the pinstripe color. The things I enjoy most are when you have to recreate something that doesn't even exist. And all you have is a, a grainy photo from you know 1910, or, or maybe even not even a photo, maybe just 
it needs to fit in this space and hold these two things together. So it's fun. It's it's more than fun. It's 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 a wonderful experience to recreate something like that. And then to have, of course, then it goes. Maybe if it's brass, it goes to the polishers, and they put that extra little effort into it to make it, you know, magically beautiful. You know, shiny and great. I call it restoration archaeology. To I could use the term dig in the dirt, but in this case, it wasn't a dirty car. Um, just to take those parts, hold them in your hand, understand the thought process that went through the person or the team of people that created that part, to understand what their vision was, how they saw this working, how they were going to utilize the technology and the equipment of that day to create this part, to go with all the other parts to make a car. Very different than what we do today. Um, in the end, it may go down the road and the wheels go around and you steer it, and the motor goes bang, bang, and up and down, but it's so different that other than the, the basic internal configuration of an internal combustion engine, it's just a whole different world. And it's fun to go back into that world and get to understand it. Now we can see what we've got. All in all, pretty good shape. We'll have to take all of the wood off, all of the little bits and pieces off. Let's see, wood, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, twelve pieces of wood in that window. Screws, my goodness, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32 screws. Each screw head's going to have to be polished and clear coated so that its brass shows. And then we're also going to have to take all of the hardware off and decide which pieces had been nickel plated. Clearly those two, that one had been, uh, and which were brass. And it's kind of interesting that they would mix up like this is clearly nickel plated. You'd think it would be all one or the other, but it's typically not. So again, we'll make the decisions which ones are nickel, which ones are polished brass, and do them accordingly. One of the subcontractors that I have used on several projects over the years is uh, a company, Britain Brass, that restores old brass parts for old cars. Well, we do automotive brass restoration, which is everything from headlamps to bulb horns to, you know, windshield frames, engine parts, whatever, need, you know, copper, brass, aluminum, anything, anything of that nature we do. Pre-World War I cars have a lot of brass. Luckily, this shop knows how to refinish, repair, or in a lot of cases, recreate these pieces. Headlamp, side lamps, and, and tail lamp, and we already had uh, some parts on the shelf from the last project too, so uh, between what he, he sent and the parts that we have, we'll be in good shape, and if we need to make parts, we will. Well, you know, I said we were going to catch up with him, and we actually caught up with him, and I pulled him off. You talk about somebody just walking in here, this is Don Lyons, everybody. Don, thank you so much for joining us and, and allowing us to be a part of your world here. Good um, morning, Greg. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm blown away. And I have a little cheat sheet card here that, that I can do, but the first question I asked without even looking at this card was, how did you get into cars in general? Well, I blame my dad for that. Yeah. Uh, I was 14 years old. We didn't have a lot of money and we needed a second car and dad had always wanted to restore a car. So he said, come on, Go with me, we're going to look for an old car. <laughs> and we found one. We found a 1929 Packard. Wow. We bought it for $75. Uh, it took two years to restore it. And when it was all said and done, we had $225 in it. And that was the car I learned to drive on. And she ran. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got to say, you know, obviously we just got to watch the whole package come together here. This isn't the first one you've done, though. Oh, um, no. No. So I, I, not to tell stories on myself, but I'm 74 now, mm -hmm. so I've been doing this for the better part of 60 years. Wow. And over that time, I have had literally every car that I ever dreamed of having, so uh, there haven't been many stones left unturned. 
How many cars did you get to do with your dad? Um, we did that together for at least 35 years. We had our own restoration shop doing our own cars. Uh, we never did customer cars. And uh, we learned it together. So you did all, those were all your own cars? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, uh, we did it together. The first car that we really set about to restore authentically as a show car. Uh, we got all done with it and said, that isn't very good. So we tore it all apart and did it over again. And we got done the second time and it still wasn't very good. So we tore it apart <laughs> and did, did it the it third again. time and we got it. <laughs> so go. we were off and running at that point. And now we know where third time's a charm comes from yeah. too. Well, how many Stoddard uh, Daytons have you done? That's the fifth one that I've That's I the did. fifth one? Yes. So, and roughly about how long does it take you guys to restore them? It just depends, doesn't it? It, it depends so much on the condition of the car you're starting with. Is that your favorite? <laughs> People always ask me that, and it's always whatever one I just finished is my favorite. So I just finished that one, <laughs> it's, it's my so favorite. that's your favorite one. You obviously started this with your dad. You know, is, is that what makes this important to you as far as that is because it takes you? Oh, absolutely. And, and you see that in the, yeah. the documentary. Yeah, absolutely. And well, that was a big part of it for that's me. That's just was it. Kind of winding up a career restoring old cars. And like I say, having had literally now every car I ever dreamed of, um, I didn't have anything more to do. And, yeah. and the passion, uh, I won't say was gone, but it wasn't burning as brightly as it did at one time. It's obviously very important. And, and in that process, you know, you want to preserve that history. Um, but what is, it, what is it to you about the importance of keeping these and bringing these back to life? I have a very passion for history in general, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a community, um, sure. fishing tackle, old cars, yeah, uh, yeah. wherever my life takes me. Uh, that's a big part of it, whatever they say. The past is prologue. You know, you know, we talk about history and we look at history and you see this, where do you think the automotive industry is gonna go as far as, you know, you look at this, this is literally art at this point. Yes. Everything's just kind of thrown together. Where do you think the automotive industry is going? Do you think we'll ever get back to the prestige of something like this here in the United States, something that decorative? Uh, I think you have to look at the auto industry as a worldwide industry. Yeah, and I think no you doubt. can safely say worldwide, um, the passion, the creativity is certainly there. It's all, yeah. Uh, now, it, that was the era of Model Ts, and certainly today we have our version of Model Ts. Sure, um, they fulfill a very utilitarian need, and that's as they should. Yeah, but whether it be Bentley, Lamborghini, Ferrari. Uh, there are still people that are passionate about making fine cars. Well, I mean, and you look at the detail and, you know, it, we touch base on this in the documentary a little bit, but, you know, everything from doing the fabric down to the leather, down to the lights, to even the tires. You, you were telling me the tires. I asked, how do you find tires for something like this? And there are actual manufacturers out there that do this for... Yes, and, and I liken it to building a house. Uh, nobody builds a house. Um, now, you may be the general contractor, but you'll have an electrician, you'll have a plumber, you'll have a roofer, you'll have a framer. You'll have all of these people that are expert at what they do, but they all need a quarterback, they all need a band leader. And that's and, you. And that's me, and I also enjoy the hands-on as well. Yeah. So I, I have to have a physical presence in that process more than just um, waving the batons and paying the bills. <laughs> yeah. Okay, in the documentary, there's a part in here where there's a, there's a piece where we don't know if it's brass or if it's nickel. Yes. We never found out. Can we find out? You bet. All right. Let's solve the mystery. Right, we? And we were looking at all of these little fasteners, all these little screw heads, this little door latch, the, the little turn screw And that's here. what you were thinking. Could they have been brass or were they nickel? Exactly. Because they It was looked, a lighter color, right? Yeah. Is that what it was? The, the brass would have been yellow and this, yeah. of course, is silver. And the thing that was confusing me was much of it was obviously brass, but there was also stuff that was obviously nickel, and that just didn't make sense that it would be, well, they, it would either be one or the other. Yeah, and that scene in the movie was very early in this process, sure. but as I got into it and really looking at it, no matter what I did, if I took off that little screw, even though the, and I think the chauffeur probably did it, polished the nickel off on the back side, you could see the nickel, even though the screw head was brass. And there was literally not one part of that interior that I took off that I couldn't find the nickel on it. It was nickel. It was nickel. So it wasn't brass. So, so it, was it wasn't nickel. brass, it was all nickel, and that's the way it's been. And it really, 
um, is a little unusual for that period. Nickel plating was certainly available, but if you look at the exterior of the car, you'll see that it is a quote unquote brass car. It's a brass car, yeah. Um, but you open that door and all the bright work was nickel. Well, we touched base on history. Yes. And where we're at right now, the building that we're in, where everything is located, all the fun stuff, mm -hmm. um, where, does, where do we go from here with this? What is, the, what is the importance to you with this? Well, this building, uh, the first element of it was constructed in 1916. Sure. And it had been added to over the years to become what it is today. And it had been an icon in the local community. Yeah. Uh, it housed the Hedden Fishing Tackle Company, which at one time was the largest fishing tackle company in the world. Yeah. And as things do, times moved on, they sure. didn't and the building was abandoned. They were moved to Fort Smith, Arkansas. Wow. And the building was falling into an advanced state of disrepair. It was only a short time away from being demolished. Yeah. Again, with my interest in history, I hated to see that happen, so my wife and I bought the building. We restored it, and it now earns its own keep. We rent out portions of it. We use portions for ourselves, sure. as you can see here. But as part of that, we also started a museum to preserve the history of the Hedden Company. And that, that alone in and of itself, that section of the building is mind-blowing what you guys have done there. So with you doing this building, you know, you got, you're open to the public, obviously. Yes, we are. And so if they want to get a hold of you or come in, it's just something that they can just do, right? Yes. Um, prior to the pandemic, uh, we did have hours. Uh, right now, what we do is on our website, we post our contact information sure. and suggest that anybody that wants to see it, feel free to call and make an appointment, and we will show it by appointment. Okay, so if I call ahead, is there a way I can come up here for a week and never leave? Sure. And you'll walk me around yep. and show Bring me Bring your sleeping bag. I'm, you probably want an air mattress to force it. Okay. Well, let's see that. I can curl up in the back of that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Don, it's such a pleasure meeting you, and uh, just love what you're doing, and what a, what a journey you've had, but... I'm so glad you preserve so much for everybody and for you know generations to come. So thank well, you. You're welcome. And I always appreciate people's um, expression of appreciation. But the truth of the matter is, Joan and I are having the time of our lives. We it's, love every minute it's, of it. Yeah. So it's, it's not. A, it's not a burden. Don't stop. Keep Don't going. Do, I'm not. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. Thank you so much. Don. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Now, as a reminder, check out the whole documentary and the entire interview if this caught your interest on our website at experiencemichiana.org. Thank you so much and hope to see you next week. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.